All right, good afternoon. I am Councilmember Costa Constantinidis, Chair of the Environmental Protection Committee. And today the committee will hear three bills addressing the sewer maintenance system and two bills addressing fire hydrant maintenance. The New York City Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, is responsible for managing the city's sanitary sewer system, which includes 14 in-city in sewage treatment plants and 7,500 miles of sewer infrastructure, conveying 1.3 billion gallons of sewage every day. In addition to the identified sewage infrastructure, the DEP maintains approximately 148,000 catch basins. The DEP operates the system pursuant to the New York State Department of Conservation's State Pollution Discharge Elimination System. If the system is not properly maintained, people are exposed to sewage backups in basements, streets, and yards. Sewage can contain a number of biological hazards, including bacteria, funguses, parasites, viruses, and airborne viruses, uh, bloodborne viruses. Exposure to sewage backups can result in a variety of adverse human health effects that include, amongst others, E. coli, shingliosis, typhoid fever, salmonella, and others. Uh, in August 2016, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, found that the DEP experienced an excessive number of sewage backups between 2011 and 2015, more than 17,000. There are also numerous instances of repeat backups in the same locations, many due to capacity issues or infrastructure maintenance. The, D the EPA thus issued an, an administrative compliance order based on its conclusion that DEP's wastewater treatment system violated the Clean Water Act. Specifically, the EPA found that DEP failed to op properly operate and maintain the wastewater treatment system. The EPA found that the DEP's state of the sewer report in 2012 and 2013 concluded that 80% or more of the confirmed sewer backups were due to, to grease and debris in the sewers. However, the DEP's state of the sewers reports did not include broken or malfunctioning catch basins. A number of backups also due to capacity-related issues on chronic areas with multiple backups on the same segment and affecting customers over a given period of time. Sewer backups most heavily affected Queens, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. There is also evidence that broken catch basins may have a prominent impact on sewer backups. In 2015, the Council passed, enacted Local Law 48 of 2015, which required the DEP to clean its catch basins at least once a year and repair broken catch basins within nine days after the receipt of a complaint. Previously, DEB had been inspecting catch basins once every three years. The first mandated report pursuant to Local Law 48 of 2015 identified thousands of catch basins that were clogged and broken. These clogged and broken catch basins may have resulted in sewage backups and resulted in flooding. Further, the areas of most malfunctioning catch basins are in southeast Queens. In community districts 11 and 13, showing the highest numbers in the city, filed by community district 12 and others, the EPA suggested that DEP should further explore the cause of sewage backups to ascertain if there was any relationship between increased sewage backups and clogged and malfunctioning catch basins. In response to EPA's administrative compliance order, the DEP has developed a targeted sewer inspection pilot, which will be conducted from July 1st, 2017 to July June 30th, 2020, and aims to conduct 55,000 sewer segment inspections over a three-year period. After the pilot phase, it is expected that the improved operation and maintenance procedures will continue and result in a reduction of sewer backups. Backflow devices. Backflow devices prevent cross connections between potable and non-potable water. In order to carry out its responsibility pursuant to the public health law, the DEP as a supplier of water must determine if its facility poses a potential hazard to the city's water supply. If a facility should pose a hazard to it due to its operation, the DEP commissioner is required to direct the installation by the owner of an improved backflow de prevention device. Should the building owner fail to comply with this directive of the DEP commissioner, he or she is subject to enforcement actions, such as cease and desist orders, criminal or civil enforcement actions, fines, penalties, and even ultimately termination of water supply of the building or any portion of the facility. Intro A12 adds a new provision that will require the DEP to report annually to the Council on, one, the number of facilities and hazardous facilities estimated to require the installation of backflow prevention devices, and two, 
the number of facilities in which backflow prevention devices have already been installed. Three, number, the number of test reports filed with DEP in the preceding year. And four, the number of violations issued for failure to install a backflow de prevention device and failure to, re to file a required test report with DEP. Fire hydrant legislation. Two bills being heard today regard fire hydrant signage and repair. DEP is responsible for the maintenance and repair of the city's 109 fire hydrants. Oh, oh sorry, 109,000 fire hydrants. Opening fire hydrants without spray caps is illegal throughout the city. Open hydrants without spray caps release approximately 1,000 gallons of water per minute, which also leads to decreased water pressure of nearby hydrants and thus threaten the safety of New Yorkers. The identification and timely repair of inoperable fire hydrants is also a safety priority for the city. According to the 2017 Mayor's Management Report, the average time it took for DEP, or DEP to repair or replace high-priority broken or inoperative hydrants was 2.5 days in FY17. The MMR does not report on non-priority hydrants. In conclusion, proper maintenance of wastewater infrastructure is necessary to prevent sewage backups and to protect the public health for a wide range of diseases caused by sewage backups into homes and businesses, clogged and broken catch basins and infrastructure may play a role in sewage backups and should be more fully explored. This also means that backflow devices need to be installed in appropriate locations and proper reporting on the installation of backflow devices must take place. Finally, fire hydrants need to be properly maintained so that when they, when, so that when needed, they can serve the life functioning, life saving functions for which they are designed. Now, let us hear from. Uh, we'll have. Well, let me first recognize a uh, member of the committee, uh, Councilmember Roy Lansman. Thank you for being here, and allow Councilmember Espinal to speak on his bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have a statement, but I just clearly, I think you hit all of the uh, important points. Uh, you know, I, I introduced this bill uh, after visiting a, a city that actually had signage uh, near the hydrants saying um, what the violation was for opening that hydrant and where they should go if they're interested in opening the hydrant. Um, you know, here in New York City, I think one of the biggest complaints that, that a lot of our officers receive, especially during the summertime, is that hydrants are open on full blast, unattended, and we're seeing thousands of gallons of water per minute being wasted. Uh, I think that this will be a great way to inform New Yorkers who don't have that common knowledge that they can get a sprinkler cap to open that hydrant and they can also, by visiting the local f uh, f um, firehouse, uh, I think that this will decrease the amount of uh, hydrants we have opened uh, at full blast and also again a great way to inform New Yorkers uh, about how they can uh, safely and legally uh, have that, that hydrant operating during the summer. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Espinal. Uh, I would like to call forward the first panel, please, from the administration. Uh, who's, who do we have on the list here? So, uh, Anastasios Georgelis from DEP. And uh, who's the other one from DEP that's testifying? And then yes. And Chief John uh, Hodgkins from the FDNY. Michael, you're going to be testifying as well or just there to support? Okay, so I'm going to swear you in as well then. Can you please raise your right hand? Do you can, you, can you sit on the dais? Do you swear or affirm to... Tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today. Thank you. All right, before you give me your testimony, I will let you know that we are trying to have a vote on uh, three pieces of legislation. When we do get a quorum, I'm going to pause, and we're going to take that opportunity, okay? Great, thank you. Please begin your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman Constantinidis and members of the committee. 
I am Anastasios Georgelis, Acting Deputy Commissioner for Water and Sewer Operations in the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. With me are Michael DeLoach, Deputy Commissioner of Public Affairs at DEP, and John Hutchins, Deputy Assistant Chief in the Bureau of Operations of the New York Fire Department and other DEP staff. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on these five bills. Introduction 821, relating to reporting on backflow prevention devices. Introduction 972, relating to fire hydrant signage. Introduction 1731, relating to fire hydrant repair standards. And introductions 1425 and 1468, relating to sewer backups. The Bureau of, the Bureau on Water the Bureau of Water and Sewer Operations, BWSO, oversees approximately 14,000 miles of water and sewer mains and 150,000 catch basins, and over 109,000 fire hydrants in New York City. Our work includes day-to-day -day management of the underground water and sewer infrastructure, emergency response to events like water main breaks, as well as capital planning and oversight of water and sewer infrastructure projects. Intro 821 of 2015 would repeal and replace existing provisions in the administrative code relating to reporting on the installation and testing of backflow prevention devices, BPDs. An annual report would replace semi-annual reports and an estimate of the total number of facilities requiring PPDs as well as the number of test reports submitted or added requirements. The number of new notifications issued by DEP that a BPD is required to be installed has been deleted, but the number of facilities, including hazardous and non-hazardous, requiring the installation of BPDs has been retained. Fin finally, the number of notices of violation issued for failure to file has been added to the number of violations for future inst to install. Protecting New York City's public water supply is of paramount importance and backflow prevention is one aspect of affording this protection. I would like to mention that DEP's extensive water quality testing and monitoring program is the frontline defense in ensuring the quality of water in the distribution system. New York City tests its drinking water in the distribution system for approximately 240 chemical constituents well above regulatory requirements. We perform more than 1,100 tests daily, 34,000 monthly, and 400,000 on an annual basis on over 36,000 samples collected from about 1,000 sampling locations throughout the city. Test results are reported to our regulators and are summarized in our annual report on the quality of New York City's drinking water. Backflow prevention devices, also known as cross-connection controls, prevent potential contamination within the premises from entering the public water supply. The possibility of contamination is caused by various kinds of plumbing configurations and or equipment that use water under pressure. If the water pressure in an internal system in the medical facility like a hospital, for example, is greater than the pressure in the public water supply system, dangerous chemicals can be inadvertently forced back into the public supply unless a properly functioning backflow prevention device is in place to keep that from happening. Protection of our drinking water through the mandated cross-connection control program, which is required by subpart 5-1.31 of the New York State Sanitary Code, is a primary element of BWSO's mission. The code contained in the public health law mandates that public water suppliers, such as DEP, require certain users to install cross-connection controls for which they must submit plans for the installation of these devices as well as annual testing and reporting once the devices have been installed. This program is approved and reviewed annually by the state and city departments of health and is reportable to the United States Environmental Protection Agency and the New York State Health Department as one of the filtration avoidance determination deliverables. Department of Health's guidance for, co for the code divides users into three categories, non-hazardous, such as a one or two family home, or a dry commercial establishment, uh, such as a cell phone store or a computer shop. Aesthetically objectionable, such as a residential building with an elevated storage tank, and hazardous, such as an auto repair shop or a dry cleaner. Department of Health's cross-connection guidance defines a hazardous facility as a building that potentially contains substances that if introduced into the public water supply would or may endanger or have an adverse effect on the health of water consumers. 
typical examples, in addition to those previously mentioned, are laboratories, sewage treatment plants, industrial or chemical plants, and mortuaries. DEP has developed a comprehensive cross-connection control program in which we initially concentrated on those facilities representing the highest risk of potential contamination of our public water supply through cross-connections. To assist building owners, we are constantly upgrading our program guidelines, most recently in May 2017. We have made extensive efforts in the identification, inspection, enforcement, and reporting of backflow prevention devices. Since 2012, we have reorganized the program by setting up individual units within BWSO that focus on specific areas of expertise. The three units are inspection, enforcement, and cross-connection review. Our active program far exceeds our commitments to the Department of Health, and we continue our progress towards ensuring that any facility that requires a backflow prevention device has one. DEP maintains an active database compromising records of on some 101,000 properties. The number of properties tracked in this database is dynamic, shifting both upward and downward with changes in the nature of the pro property's usage profile. We've been compiling more detailed and current information about the number of buildings in the city that required backflow prevention devices via both data mining and field inspection. Residential properties are not a subject of concern except where there are large boilers that, are used, that use chemically treated water. Our approach has been to target our inspection resources more efficiently by identifying the types of commercial and residential properties that are most likely to pose a risk. Our inspection unit uses a GIS mapping system along with information from the Department of City Planning to generate a citywide map that targets potential high-risk areas and buildings. Each year we aim to inspect three to 4,000 properties citywide. We continue to fill gaps we continue to fill the gaps in our knowledge by getting inspectors into the field and doing the labor-intensive job of going to previously identified properties. As a follow-up to our field inspections, our enforcement unit takes action where necessary. The Ministry of Code provides for various enforcement measures, from issuance of notice of violations, returnable to the Environmental Control Board, and associated penalties, to termination of water service and disabling of equipment that creates risk to the public water supply. Our enforcement efforts do not stop with the issuance of an NOV. In addition to the penalties and enforcement actions, the unit reviews the lists of properties cited to evaluate whether reinspection is warranted based on failure to submit a report or install a device. Once a property owner is notified and hires a licensed master plumber for the installation of a backflow prevention device, our review unit is responsible for the review and approval of the backflow prevention plans, the, in the initial installation testing report, and all subsequent annual testing reports. It is significant to point out that since 1987, all new construction is subject to evaluation of, of the need of a backflow prevention device in order to obtain a certificate of occupancy from the Department of Buildings. Consequently, post-1987 construction, Protocols assure compliance with the intent of subpart 5-1.31 referenced above. A decade ago, the number of so-called high hazardous facilities was estimated at 22,765. This number represented a presumptive list generated based on Department of Finance usage class categories and was intended to establish a starting point for identifying locations that had the highest probability of requiring a backflow prevention device. These inspections were completed in 2011 and with, with a consultant inspection contract that began in January 2010. There are currently 43,230 locations that have one or more backflow prevention devices installed. There are a total of 92,308 devices installed at these properties. The reason there are more devices installed than the number of locations is that some properties require more than one device. Of the universe of the 101,000 properties inspected, 51,000 either have a device installed currently or have been notified of the need to install a device. DEP would be able to comply with the reporting requirements of this bill with the exception of the first, the estimated number of hazardous and non-hazardous facilities requiring a backflow prevention device. As mentioned, these numbers change with the uses that buildings and facilities are put to. 
The number of properties tracked is dynamic, shifting both upward and downward with changes in the property's usage profile. Properties can be reclassified from a status of need to one of no need if the nature of that activity is at the property changes. For example, if a gas station that uses hazardous chemicals and pressurized equipment were to be converted to a retail business supply store, the requirements regarding backfill prevention for that distinct property could change. These assessments are subject to, subject to continual evaluation on the part of DEP staff. As such, it would be understood that any reporting statistic represents a snapshot in time subject to adjustment. Intro 972 of 2015 would require a DEP to place signage on fire hydrants indicating that opening or tampering with hydrants is prohibited and provide information on penalties and how to request that a hydrant be opened such as, a sp as for a spray cap. Illegally open fire hydrants release up to 1,000 gallons of water per minute and can reduce water pressure in neighborhoods, making it difficult to fight fires. Hydrants can be opened legally if equipped with a city-approved spray cap, which releases only 20 to 25 gallons per minute, ensuring adequate water pressure and reducing the risk that a child can be knocked over and injured by the force of the water. Spray caps can be obtained by an adult 18 or over, free of charge, at local firehouses. When a resident goes to the local firehouse to request a spray cap, she or he fills out the required paperwork and an officer installs the spray cap in accordance with safety protocols. Depending on demand, weather, fire activity, water pressure, and other factors, the officer in charge may vary the protocols. FDNY then turns the hydrant on and off at designated times. This past summer, DP joined with the Department of Youth and Community Development, FDNY, and the South Bronx Overall Economic Development Corporation to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Hydrant Education Action Team, HEAT program as we call it. Heat has, developed, heat has helped reduce reports of illegally open hydrants. HEAT deploys teams of teams hired through the Department of Youth and Community Development Summer's, summer Youth Employment Program to inform New Yorkers about the dangers of illegally opening hydrants. In partnership with the South Bronx Overall Economic Development Corporation, DEP deploys four teams of 10 to 12 young adults who distribute literature, posters, and other informational materials about fire hygiene safety at community events, parades, green markets, churches, and libraries. The outreach campaign focuses on neighborhoods in northern Manhattan and the Bronx that have historically seen high rates of unauthorized fire hydrants use during heat waves. In addition to literature, the teams distribute water, the teams distribute reusable water bottles and other souvenirs that promote the safe operation of fire hydrants. Opening a hydrant illegally can result in fines up to $1,000 and imprisonment for up to 30 days or both. We do not believe installation of signage citywide is warranted. We are concerned about the cost of producing and maintaining signage on 109,000 hydrants throughout the city. We are not sure the information about the enforcement placed on a sign will act as a deterrent, and we are concerned that warnings about enforcement will lead, would tend to undermine the collaborative nature of our heat outreach efforts. We believe the success of our community outreach efforts confirms that this approach to reducing unlawful use is preferred. We would be willing to discuss the with the committee expanding community outreach or other ideas to further encourage and enhance compliance with the law. Intro 1731 of 2017 would establish standards for fire hydrant repairs. In addition to rulemaking and reporting requirements, High priority hydrants, including those near a hospital, school, city, senior citizen housing, and others as determined by DP, would have to be repaired within seven calendar days of receiving a complaint and non priority hydrants within 10 calendar days. There are 109,000 hydrants in the city of, over which DP and FDNY have oversight. There are also hydrants that belong to the Department of Parks and Recreation. The Metropolitan, Trans the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, and other entities. The primary purpose of fire hydrant is fire suppression. However, hydrants also... Yeah. 
we can just hold our place there for a moment so we have a uh, quorum for our vote. <coughs> All right, thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Do we have to switch tapes or anything? Or? Okay. All right, great. All right, so where can I shorten this? Okay. All right, so uh, we at this time are going to switch to a vote on three pieces of legislation uh, you know, in order to meet our goal of reducing uh, city emissions 80% by the year 2050. Um, there is lots of work to be done in many areas of improving our accessibility to uh, renewable energy and uh, making sure that uh, red tape and government, we get to work quicker with one another in order to get the desired result of making it as easy to be green as it is to be traditional. And these three pieces of legislation do just that. Uh, the, so intro 1630A would require the administration to produce a plan that would encourage city employees. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Could you call the roll and I can go and then we could do the... Um, I, pr I, I have left and half. I just took out like two pages. Just give me two seconds. No, I don't, wa I don't want to interrupt your, <laughs> your presentation. It's important. Yep. I respect that. Um, if I could vote and be on the way, I, you I guys promise could you I'll do the record. Uh, this conversation would, I promise to get, get you done quick, Roy. All right. Uh, it's, uh, 1630A would require the administration to produce a plan to encourage city employees to voluntarily increase their use of solar energy. Intro 1639 would require the administration to create a plan to encourage the voluntary increase of solar energy use within business improvement districts. Intro 1644A would require the city to establish within the Buildings Department an Office of Alternative Energy to assist with technical review and the approval of applications, as well as provide guidance to applicants with a connection with alternative energy projects and to support technical research for advancing energy legislation. Uh, so with that, I vote, I rec recommend a yes vote on all three pieces of legislation, and if the clerk could please call the roll. Lee Martin, committee clerk, roll call vote committee on environmental protection. All items are coupled. Chair Constantin Dees. Vote aye. Lanceman. Aye. Ulrich. Yes. My vote of three in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstention. All items have been adopted by the committee. Uh, if we can leave this, leave the vote open for a few minutes, that'd be great. Thank you. Tell us if you can please uh, continue your testimony. Thank you. The primary purpose of a fire hydrant is fire suppression. However, hydrants also serve other useful functions. For example, hydrants provide a method of testing the distribution system's flow capa capabilities. They also provide a means for flushing the system mains. FDNY and DEP have a long and succe successful relationship when it comes to public safety. In fact, DEP personnel and units respond to fire notifications of varying severity by FDNY. Upon a fire event, FDNY notifies DEP's Emergency Communications Center, which then notifies the appropriate DEP water maintenance yard. DEP personnel are dispatched to every fire two alarms and above to ensure that the FDNY has the water pressure and resources they require in emergencies. In some cases, at the request of FDNY, DEP personnel will also respond to one alarm fire events. In addition, DEP personnel stay on site throughout the fire, un fire event until released by FDNY. Overall, DEP's role in response to fire events is to provide assistance and guidance to FDNY regarding their use of the water system in firefighting operations and to assess system pressures and performance. To ensure that a hydrant will work properly when it is needed, a periodic testing and maintenance program must be followed. Although hydrants are operated by members of the fire department, it is generally the water utility's responsibility to maintain them in working order. As recommended in the Manual of Water Supply Practices, all hydrants should be inspected regu regularly, at least once a year, to ensure their satisfaction in operation. In freezing climates, dry barrel hydrants may require two inspections per year. A comic a common technique is to perform one inspection in the fall and, and another in the spring. FDNY inspects the more than 109,000 hydrants twice a year, in spring and fall. FDNY inspectors record results of their inspection in BWSO's database and designate whether the hydrant repair is priority or non-priority. 
This information is then automatically routed in, in the database to our repair crews. To strive for continuous improvement, DEP has started a hydrant inspection tablet mobile inspection pilot program with FDNY. This program uses a web-based mobile application on tablets so FDNY inspectors can locate hydrants in a map view, enter inspection results in the field, and automatically upload them to the database. This will help reduce FDNY's effort and inspection times even further. As specified in FDNY's All Units Circulars 205, a priority hydrant is defined as a hydrant that is the only hydrant on the, in the block or a hydrant that is vital to the protection of high profile locations or critical infrastructure, such as such lo locations such as hospitals, schools, senior housing, bridges, tunnels, and mass transit systems. In addition, two adjacent hydrants in a block that are out of service are both reported as requiring priority repair. In an effort begun in 2009 to improve response times, DEP set an ambitious but achievable target of 10 days to repair high priority hydrants. As a result of discussions with the Mayor's Office of Operations, effective January 2014, the target has been changed to seven days in the Mayor's Management Report. Reporting in the September 2017 Fiscal Year 18 MMR, as shown in the table below, DEP's average time to repair high priority hydrants has been three days since two fiscal year 2015, which is significantly lower than our target of seven days. Inoperative hydrants are generally reported by FDNY through local fire company surveys of neighboring hydrants. Less than 1% of the city's 109,000 hydrants are in inoperative at any given time. As you, as you can see from the September 2017 MMR, DEP aims to ensure that there are fewer than 1% of broken and inoperative hydrants citywide. We work hard with FDNY to address high priority hydrant repairs immediately to ensure that there is adequate supply of water for firefighting operations. The actual backlog, backlog of broken and inoperative hydrants citywide from fiscal year 2015 to 2017 was between 0.50% to 0.54%. The current year to date backlog is f in fiscal year 2018 is 0.38%, which is a significant decrease compared to the past three fiscal years. Most importantly, we are below the MMR's annual target of 1%. The average time to repair high priority broken and inoperative hydrants from fiscal year 2015 to fiscal year 2017 was between 2.5 and 2.9 days. The current fiscal year 2 2018 year to date is 2.8 days, which is significantly lower than MMR's annual target of seven days. While DEP already meets the proposed target on the time to repair high priority hydrants, which is a paramount, which is the paramount criterion for public safety, we do not believe that the dedication of additional resources required to reduce the backlog of non-priority hydrants further is warranted given the needs of all the components of the system that demand our attention. Finally, the real-time reporting requirements in the bill are infeasible and of doubtful utility in light of the repair protocols we have outlined above. The close coordination between FDNY and DEP and our exemplary record, which exceeds MMR targets by as much as or more than 100%. Intro 1425 of 2017 would require that by December 31st, 2018, DEP submit and post on its website a plan to prevent sewer backups, SBUs. Also ad addressing S sewer backups is intro 1468 of 2017, which would amend the administrative code to require that where an SBU occurs more than once at the same location within a 12 month period, the portion of the sewer system causing the second or subsequent backup is identified and cleaned within 10 days of such subsequent backup. As New York City's water and wastewater utility, DEP provides vital services to more than 8 million New Yorkers, delivering over 1 billion gallons of fresh drinking water and treating approximately 1.3 billion gallons of wastewater daily. To reliably treat this volume of wastewater, DEP utilizes a network of more than 7,500 miles of sewers to convey wastewater to one of its 14 wastewater treatment plants. 
to operate and maintain the many components of the ex extensive sewer system, DEP has five repair yards, seven sewer maintenance yards, a fleet of specialized vehicles, and a staff of laborers, supervisors, engineers, and analysts. Over the last decade, DEP has shifted from a reactive to a proactive data-driven approach to operating and maintaining the sewer system. DEP employs the principles of adaptive management to continually improve our sewer maintenance program while balancing our overarching responsibility to deliver high quality drinking water and treat wastewater every day in an affordable and sustainable manner. DEP's rigorous sewer inspection, analysis, and cleaning program has produced tangible improvements to the level of sewer service citywide. In the last five years, we have achieved significant improvements in many of our key indicators, demonstrating the enhanced reliability of our system. For example, between fiscal year 2012 and fiscal year 2016, total SPU complaints dropped 25% and confirmed SPUs dropped 49%. These reductions are a result of DEP's ongoing operations and maintenance program, which relies on both responding to complaints and utilizing programmatic efforts to prevent backups. DEP also targets its efforts on reducing the amounts of fats, oil, and grease, fog, discharged to the sewer system. These efforts include reg regulations that mandate the use of green grease interceptors in certain commercial establishments, such as restaurants, as well as extensive public outreach to inform New Yorkers about actions they can take to prevent the improper disposal of grease into the system, a primary cause of SPUs. DEP stepped up its fog outreach of efforts in 2015 to inform the public about grease problems in the sewer infrastructure. To date, the outreach effort has reached over 60,000 households in targeted communities throughout through a combination of activities including door-to-door -door canvassing and workshops with community organizations and local houses of worship. The outreach program is also closely coordinated with the New York City Housing Authority where similar issues exist. Additionally, our education staff conduct classroom and assembly programs and has developed a spe special curriculum for teachers on the topic of Greece and its proper disposal. Most recently, in July 2017, we augmented our proactive approach by implementing a three-year pilot program to conduct, to conduct targeted sewer inspections in parts of the city that have a relatively higher rate of SBUs. Using the principles of adaptive management, DEP will evaluate the results of this pilot and identify additional opportunities to improve our overall sewer maintenance program. All of DEP's efforts, including the pilot program, are set forth in DEP's sewer backup prevention and response plan, copies of which I'm glad to provide you today. DEP performs these proactive sewer inspections and response through its sewer operations and analysis program. The program was instituted in 2011 in an effort to reduce the number of recurrent SBUs. SOAP locations are defined as sewer segments that experienced a recurrent confirmed SBU in a three month period. A sewer segment is defined as a city block. Once we identify the SOAP location, these locations are referred to field operations for investigation and analysis of the sewer segments. The investigation may lead to cleaning, spot repair, or referral for capital replacement. At times, field crews identify sewer conditions that require cleaning beyond their capabilities or determine that sewer needs to be televised. For example, the size and condition of the sewer or record of recent repeating cleanings may, lo may limit the crew's ability to take effective action. In these instances, the work is transferred to DEP's Capacity Management Operation and Maintenance Section, CMOM. CMOM then delineates the, uh, the specific needs and boundaries of the work via more robust field inspection. Once the scope is defined, it can be assigned to DEP's citywide contractors for cleaning, debris removal, and internal visual inspection utilizing a sewer camera. Once cleaning and, and televising work is completed, CMOM inspectors report findings to field operation and emergency reconstruction staff as needed. Once DEP completes remedial measures through the SOAP program, the sewer segment enters a 12-month monitoring period. During that time, if a, an additional confirmed SBU occurs on that segment, DEP identifies and elevates the segment to our SBU Recurrent After Soap, SRES program. 
and assigned it to the CMOM section to develop and implement an action plan tailored to site-specific conditions. The CMOM analysis uses tools as closed-circuit TV to evaluate the structural integrity of the sewer and engineering analysis of drainage plans and as-built drawings to ensure that the system is functioning as designed. CMOM personnel may also perform walkthrough inspections of larger sewers. Corrective action plans recommended by CMOM may include programmatic degreasing, flushing, or repair or replacement of a portion of the sewer. BWSO has improved its program to address fog. We identified liquid degreasing locations, which are locations that have recurrent or chronic SPUs where grease is the contributing cause. Sewer segments experience two or more SPUs where grease is the contributing factor are flagged to their respective borough managers for assessment and consideration to add to the programmatic LDG cleaning locations. Both intro 1468 and intro 1425 address identification and cleaning of locations with more than one SBU during a 12 month period. So my comments apply to both bills. DEP has a robust plan to address SBUs and has recently commenced a three year pilot program to further determine appropriate and effective enhancements to our plan. We would ask that the council either defer legislative action on these bills until the pilot has been completed or amend the requirements of the bill to reflect DEP's commitment to update the council on its progress in implementing the plan, including the pilot. We look forward to working with the committee to most effectively and efficiently reduce further system sewer backups. And, I, and thank, again, thank you for this opportunity to testify. I will be glad to answer any questions. Uh, thank you for your testimony. At uh, this time, I'll just have the clerk to call the roll uh, on the, the vote on the bills. Uh, continuation roll call, Committee on Environmental Protection, introduction 1630A, 1639A, and 1644A, Council Member 11. I vote aye. The vote now stands at four in the affirmative. At this point, we're going to close the roll on these pieces of legislation. Thank you. Thank you for your some patience as we uh, try to balance both today. All right, so I, I definitely appreciate your testimony. Um, so tell me a little bit about uh, what percentage of sewage backups DEP is determined the caused by grease. So the exact percentage varies. I think it's between seventy and eighty percent, depending on which area we are. And w and what basis do we do we use that? What what, what sort of metric are we using to sort of say that grease is the culprit? So when our maintenance crews respond to a complaint and they go to out there, they, they start by opening up the mantle covers. And they, you know, when they look, investigate the sewer, they look for signs for what could possibly be causing an issue. So if they see surcharge conditions in the sewer, they look for tell, telltale signs of uh, grease. So if they see grease deposits, then they, they'll in indicate that it's a grease condition and they also indicate what level. Is it like a light grease condition to a, 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 a more a robust grease condition. And when these backups occur, we're doing that on every catch base and every line. We're checking these 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 instances to see what's causing it. So every time we respond to a three one one complaint about a sewer backup, crews go out to inspect the sewer in front of the property. All right. And then, how, how what percentage does debris uh, play in these uh, backups beyond just grease? So I don't, I don't have the specific metric on debris, but, but grease and debris are the primary uh, force in, in causing backups. But they're less, le you're, you're stating less or so than grease. So debris is less than grease, yes. Less than grease, all right. Um, how about uh, city tree roots? Do they play at all a role in, in, in sewer backups? So city tree, tree roots aren't uh, normally found in the city sewer. They're normally found in the city sewer. No, we don't have a heavy problem with roots in the city sewer. We don't? No. Okay. Um, so what, what is the reason? So looking at catch basins, looking at the catch basin sort of cleaning program, uh, what, what role does clogged or broken catch basins play in, in backups? So, so catch basins are, are used to convey stormwater off the street and into the sewer system. Mm -hmm. So, so 
we our goal is to inspect the catch basins now on an annual cycle right. and clean them as we find they, when they're required to be cleaned. Mm -hmm. uh, having a clean catch basin is, is vital to convey the storm water off the street and into the sewer. Having broken catch basins, w we, we could discuss uh, in further detail, but that would prevent flow from getting into the sewer. So I don't, we don't generally see a correlation between broken catch basins and sewer backups. There might be flooding in the street, and then you might have some flooding, uh, have conditions with the homeowners, but generally broken catch basins aren't a leading contributor to sewer backups. So sewer backups are primarily caused by, from what you're saying, grease and debris. So sewer backups is when, when the sewer experiences a surcharge condition. So it's primarily the focus, that, or the reason we find is there's some kind of a blockage in the sewer that's causing the sewer backups. And those, those conditions are over 60% grease and debris, a, a large portion of the other. Yes. Right? Uh, so what does you know, the department determine the main reasons people would discard grease down the drains of their home and businesses, especially when, in particular communities, uh, they're having a, a lion's share of the backups? So we, we try and encourage everybody not to put grease into the sewer. So right. on, on the commercial side, there is a robust inspection uh, program where – uh, restaurants and other eating establishments are required to have grease, into s grease uh, traps and, and, and devices to prevent grease from entering into the sewer system. And there is a program where we go out and, inf and ins inspect and enforce the regulations regarding grease traps in commercial establishments. On a residential side, we're, we're, we've started doing robust outreach programs, and, and we're looking always to improve that. And what sort of outreach have you done in the in these sort of areas that are having the most backups? So I don't have. So I think we've reached out to sixty thousand homeowners. I think I said in the in the testimony, mm -hmm. and I think that was predominantly uh, community boards twelve and thirteen in Queens. And we've also piloted a lot of the outreach with uh, the New York City Housing Authority. And we're also starting to do outreach in with some of the public schools as well. Right. And what's the rationale for the public schools? So the rationale is, is to try to get the message out to the, to the most, uh, most effectively to the most amount of people. So I think uh, the rationale there is if, if we could uh, try to reach out to all the, the children in the households, they'll carry that message home with them and try to police uh, the households. And so basically asking the kids to sort of remind their parents that that's a bad idea. Just, just for them to enforce the idea that, you know, we should all be aware, similar to what we do with recycling and, and, and seatbelts in your car. I know in my house getting the message out to the children always are a, a positive enforcement. Now the, the ch children will always remind you when they think you're doing something wrong, which you told them. I, I have an 8-year-old. I'm well aware. <laughs> Uh, so what sort of impact has this Cease the Grease uh, op campaign yielded so far? Uh, I don't have any metrics on that with me, but we'll f um, we could get back to you on that. Sometimes it does take a little time before you actually see results. So sometimes just saying it once isn't enough. You might have to repeat it a couple times before you change uh, behavior. And are, is the campaign continuously going? Are we still sort of speaking to folks in these areas? Yes. And what's and we're still do are we giving out materials or giving out sort of things to sort of capture the grease? Uh, I I believe we are. I don't have any with me, but I, I'm sure we could get you all the details. You showed me a nice picture, yeah. <laughs> yeah we have lots of stuff. All right, so I mean, definitely would want to um, see those. And I guess the, so. The biggest question I have, right, is is this? There's you say that that broken and, uh, and clogged catch basins have nothing to do with. Uh, sewer backups. And yet, in the same communities, we're seeing the highest number of clogged and broken catch basins, but also the, the most sewage backups in Queens, in Southeast Queens. So how do we reconcile those numbers? What is, what is happening that we can do better? Like, how do we reconcile that together? So, so we could work at seeing whatever metrics you're looking at that, that bring you to your uh, conclusions. But uh, from what we're looking at, Specifically in Southeast Queens, uh, the system is, is 
a separate system, so stormwater and sanitary flow aren't in the same pipe, so they're, they're, they're separated. On the storm side, we, we are committed, and this administration has committed $1.7 billion. Which is, which is a big deal, absolutely. In the storm that's exciting. infrastructure, and that, that's primarily in, in the southeast Queens mm -hmm. area, which is going to bring storm sewer relief. So getting those storm sewers in there which, uh, would help get storm flow into those new pipes. And how, how are we doing? I know that uh, we passed the bill earlier this year on the reporting, but things are moving along. Yeah, we're, we're, we're still on target. Great. Glad to hear that. Now, as far as uh, backflow devices, let's sort of quickly sort of transition um, to that. How long do the building owners have to comply with the directive of the commissioner? 30 days. 30 days. And is it a sort of self-certification? Um, so what, you know, how do we know that they're complying within 30 days? And what enforcement actions are we then taking um, if they're maybe not getting back to us or not doing this in a, in a quick and, and you know, judicious manner? So they have 30 days, but not all, they don't always comply within 30 days. But as if they at least take steps and they submit a plan for the backflow prevention device, we would work with them to try to implement it. So it might go past 30 days if they show intention of installing the device. And then once they submit to you a plan, let's say they have intention of installing, uh, how long does it take from the time they submit that plan? How much lead time do we give them to actually install it? Have you can come and, and you guys have done this before. <laughs> State your name for the record, please. It's uh, Mark, Mark Safari. Mm -hmm. uh, the, as soon as they, they get it, they have a one month to apply the, for uh, the high obtain service of a professional engineer to submit a plan. When the plan is approved, they have 60 days to install the device. So once, once they sort of submit a plan, they're sort of on a clock of 60 days. And how do we verify that they're meeting that 60-day well, the, after the calendar? Device, after the device is installed, the licensed plumbers and has to submit the initial test to, you know, to the department. All right, and we're following up to make sure that they're, we're issuing enforcement actions or we're sending right. somebody out to follow up? No, I, if the, we, our database uh, enforcement uh, constantly they look at our database, if the initial test is not submitted or annual tests are, are not submitted, then they go issue the violation and how order and then constantly and how many uh, times has the commissioner issued the directive to building owners to install an approved backflow device uh, I don't have the status very in front of me but so mm, your question is how many commission orders we've uh, sent out Correct. We installed a device in 2016. It was 2,266. 266? 2,266. 2,266. And of those 2,266 buildings, have all of those backflow devices been installed, to our knowledge? Not, not all of them. Uh, let's see. So I, I have here that in 2016, we also issued uh, a little over 1,300 summonses for failure to install a backflow prevention device. But it just, just to be clear, I'm not, sh I'm not sure if that's a subset of the 16, of the 2026, or, 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 or it could be previous years. Just sort of, of all, the, of all the universe of those buildings that need backflow devices, we issued 1,300 violations for failure to for install failure to a backflow install. device in 2016. And now that those folks have sort of been sort of cited, you know, cited for this, what is the process to make sure that they comply? So, so we continue to work with the ECB, and, and mm -hmm. we, we monitor them, and as you know, it, a portion of them get in with the, within compliance, and, and the ones right. that don't, we escalate either penalties or... or uh, what, are, what are the penalties? The... 500 to 5,000. 500 to 5,000. I, I can get you all the details. I don't and have is that enough to sort of make it more than the cost of doing business? Is it, is, what does a backflow device cost? So a backflow prevention device from a simple one in, the, in like a smaller building is 
between three and four thousand, and and they could escalate up to twenty thousand dollars. So, in some cases, it I mean it's cheaper for them not to install it, right? And and so we're, we're, we're following we're up constantly, right? We're happy to look into that further. We'll okay, I just want to make sure that we are. Uh, Ensuring that, you know, ensuring that they're actually installing it and not just sort of continuously paying the fine, right? But there, there is a subsequent, if they are all failing to do, then we, we do order cease and desist for the water service. How many of those have we issued? Well, I don't have a status at this time. Right now. Can you get back to me? Yeah. Get back to the committee, please? Thank you. So w what, what I can tell you is as the years have progressed, we've increased the number of annual inspections and people mm -hmm. in compliance. So we, we are seeing a trend that goes up several thousand every year. And how many inspectors are out there doing that work? Uh, I, uh, five inspectors. We had a five inspectors. Uh, currently, we, we have three. So this three? Two, two a transfer and a resignation. So we have to backfill those. So we're, are we going to get those slots filled? Yes. And, then, and those five individuals are, are, in this case, currently three individuals. They, they, this is all that they do, or what is their? This is their full-time job. So they're full-time. They just I eat, sleep, and drink blank flow yeah. all day long. <laughs> 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 all right. Just, just you know, making sure that we're, we're all speaking the same language. So do we have any idea when those two jobs will be hired? Is there postings? I, I, I currently don't have an update on that. Okay. I definitely would like to, if you can get back to the committee with um, that information, that would be extremely helpful. Uh, and then sort of lastly, on uh, my colleagues' bills in relation to fire hydrants, uh, on the priority fire hydrants, do you have any objection for us uh, setting some sort of rule into law on those priority hydrants? If, if do you have, I, I understand your objection on the non-priority hydrants, but do you have any issues with us sort of setting a timeline on priority hydrants? I know right now you're at 2.5 days. That yeah, sounds pretty good. I think we feel like we've been, you know, obviously through the MMR, been doing a very good job and continuing to improve. And I think we're happy to talk to you about ways we can codify and look into specific metrics. I'm, I'm, I think I'm a big believer in codifying things yep. because there's a. And right now, it we, we sounds like we're doing really well in priority hydrants, but there is a possibility in the future we may not be doing so well. And the nature of what we do is there are going to be different people sitting in all of our chairs in the future. We want to make sure that we set a good baseline, right, and make sure that the high standards that we hold will always be upheld. Definitely. I think we just have, you know, we just need to talk about the fine print. There's some issue versus priority hydrants versus priority repairs. And so we just want to make sure that we're all speaking with the same intention. I am in agreement with you. Great. All right. With that, I don't have any colleagues to ask any other questions. So I will, uh, I will of course, stay in touch with you guys, and thank you for your testimony. We'll follow up on the outstanding stuff. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So the next panel, uh, Stuart O'Brien, the Plumbing Foundation. Author Clock from Plumbers Local One, and Kim Lawton from Spring Jam Block Association. All right. Um, with that, I'm going to have our uh, attorney, Samara Swanson, swear you roll in. Can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? I do. I do. Ms. Lawton, would you like to go first? Thank you. Wonderful. Good afternoon. Hello? Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman, 
members of the Environmental Protection Committee, community members and advocates, members of Spring Jam Block Association, um, the JFK IBID, and all of the vested stakeholders. My name is Kim Lawton. I stand, well actually I'm sitting here before you today as president of the Spring Jam Block Association. I'm also the secretary of the JFK IBID, which was recently formed and signed into legislation. And I'm also a resident homeowner, my primary reason for being here today. Um, I am in favor, and the majority of my constituents are definitely in favor of the legislation before us in regards to the proposed changes and respect to the enhancements regarding the sewer and infrastructure systems um, in Southeast Queens. Um, I live off of Rockaway Boulevard and South Conduit Avenue near 155th Street and 159th Street. Those areas are currently in the JFK IBID catchment area. As everyone is aware, Southeast Queens has had a flooding problem for many years and the infrastructure that currently exists has not been sufficient to handle all the business that comes its way. Um, although I have a prepared statement and I will continue with it, I would just like to digress a little bit and state that I'm not sure how the gentlemen who just testified um, when looking at the data stated that the majority of our flooding is due to Greece because if you look at those areas that were pinpointed, those are the areas where the infrastructure hasn't been updated in almost 30 or 40 years. So I would just say not to digress that, although we're here in terms of the reporting, I think that further supports why we need to have these bills into effect and why we should have an independent person um, investigate this. Because to say that, and I mean no disrespect, that all of the neighborhoods in Southeast Queens are the only people frying chicken, um, I, I, I divert and I, I, I say that that's a dis digression from why we're here. But anyway, as you are aware, Southeast Queens has had a flooding problem for many years, and the infrastructure that currently exists has not been sufficient to handle the business that comes our way. Actually, the infrastructure is outdated, overcapacitated, and has not been sufficient. Um, I'd just like to note that during Hurricane Irene, even before Sandy, members of the community of those specific areas that we're here to address, including myself, were flooded up to our knees in our basements and our homes in sewage, garbage and feces. Senator Sanders, who was the councilman at the time, um, we felt was not helping us to cure that situation. We really weren't sure how to go about addressing that issue. And I, I appreciate being invited here today to testify because at that time, the only thing we knew was that we were flooded in our basements, that we were not enjoying the quality of life that everyone else in the surrounding communities in Queens were. So we went on New York One, and we complained about the flooding and about how critical it was to our community and to our quality of life. And this is when all of these different bills and all of these different studies came to fruition as far as the flooding, specifically in Southeast Queens. Although at the time we made complaints to the councilman's office, to DEP, to 311, to city officials, no one addressed our cries for help until Councilman Sanders, who was now Senator Sanders, and Councilman Richards created these bills and help to create these studies regarding the flooding. So I appreciate that, as well as you, Chairman. I remember you from the last time. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So I'm here today. I don't have all the logistics and all the specifics and all the terminology that was used before the committee. But I'm here as a homeowner who's been a homeowner for 17 years, a city employee who struggles 
to keep that home to the best of my ability. I'm here as the president of Spring Jam, and actually our association was created because of the flooding. We've done different things thus far, as far as being a part of the first mixed use I bid, and we have different beautification committees and different things for our children. But we started because, forgive my rudeness, we were mad as hell, and we felt that Southeast Queens was not being addressed properly as far as the infrastructure and flooding problem that has existed almost as long as I've been alive, almost. So I would say that I urge the committee to approve these bills. Um, the sewer and catch basin problems with, and other aspects of the infrastructure was a nightmare and is a nightmare, although it is being addressed. However, the initial stages that were put into motion um, and although there's been allocation of billions of dollars to support this, I would also encourage the legislation that would implement a plan for upgrades and temporary enhancements, but also support the reporting of the stages to support the information being given to the community as to what is actually being done and not what's just on paper. In summary, I thank you for your time and your consideration and the action that has been taken strongly towards this, this critical issue. Um, there were other members of the community from Community Board 12 and 13 who wanted to be here, but the meeting had to be rescheduled. So although I do not speak for them specifically, I know they do support the approval of this legislation, and I thank you so much for hearing what I have to say. Well, Ms. Lund, I th I, I, we take uh, your concerns very seriously. Uh, you you know, we, we, know, we understand that uh, Southeast Queens for too long had uh, been left to sort of fend for itself when it came to flooding. Uh, we were glad to see um, the administration come through with the $1.7 billion commitment yes. to uh, bring relief to the homeowners who have needed relief for far too long uh, and, and were being ignored. Um, and we passed legislation last year. Uh, I think I, we were out there together yes. to announce legislation that we were going to have yearly updates um, to ensure that um, this project uh, in, as, as its sort of wide scope, right, $1.7 billion is we need to know, like, what's happening block by block, uh, neighborhood by neighborhood to ensure that we're getting it right. And I, I agree. So I, I'm with you. And as the lead sponsor of these bills, I, I share your advocacy <laughs> to get them done. Thank um, but I really want to work in partnership with you. And so if I just want to ask you, just if you guys, gentlemen, can just indulge me for a couple of seconds. I know um, speaking about the sewage bills, um, have you ever observed flooding and sewage backups uh, at the same time? Yes. And actually, yesterday, I didn't get a lot of sleep worrying about the same thing. But I can say, since there's been attention brought to this matter, DEP is cleaning it out more frequently, and we're not seeing the level of flooding that we've seen in the past. But yesterday, I did see the flooding and the sewer backup at the same time. So you did see flooding, but in addition to flooding, you found sewage in your home? Um, not in my home. But what's happening, in it, what's happening is where I live mm -hmm. is directly behind JFK. Right. We're below sea level. Mm -hmm. So it started from the corner house, and it's starting to progress. So yesterday, although there was a heavy rain, it didn't reach to the middle of the block where I live, near the FAA building. Right. But the people at the corner did have that. They did have that. They did have both sewage yeah. and water in their basement. Yeah, and so 157th Street, because we take pictures and everything, and we send it to 311 and the councilman and everything. 157th Street in that area near South uh, Conduit, you could literally swim in that area. It, the ponding is unbelievable. But beyond the ponding, there's also sewage in that water. Yes. Can you send me those pictures as well? Yes. I'll have my staff reach out to you afterwards just so we have it for the committee. Yes. Because uh, I know they said on the record that sewage backups and flooding are two different sets of pipes, and that, that's not possible. Okay, well, but I, I, that's I know why where I, 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 I where it's coming from, but I know I, I want to. I want to. I believe there's a correlation. 
I, I, you and I are in the same camp, right? Yes. I, I think that we, we have the uh, uh, data with the most broken catch basins and, and, and issues in Southeast Queens also have to do with the most flooding issues. So um, I think there's a correlation there. I just think we need to build up our evidence, as they say, right? I'm an attorney by trade. Right. So we need to sort of lay out our evidence uh, a little bit better. And I will just say one other thing I know this is not like a dispositional hearing, um, but as far as reaching out to the community, I did see under Councilman Richards and Senator Sanders one outreach within the last three years as far as DEP doing a town hall uh, or what well, wasn't a town hall, but an outreach. And we were informed about that like the day before it was happening. So, and you know, we were told, oh, it may be Greece, et cetera. But I think that the community is on board. We have an excellent representative from DEP, Miss Karen Ellis. I know who, her well, she's yeah, great. Yeah, and she's really outstanding. But you know, her powers are limited. And I think that if the community and DEP and city officials really wanna work um, to, uh, to address this uh, this issue and to actually do the real work, we should have more outreach. I don't think it's just based on grease and people frying chicken. I'm not trying to be you know, disrespectful. It has to be a correlation when you look at the areas that it's affecting compared to other areas. Uh, I am, I mean, I know that the mayor has uh, communicated to me and the DEP has communicated to me their desire to get this done. You have my commitment and I know that Donovan Richards cares deeply about his community. He's a fighter for his neighborhood. He's yeah. helping deliver. So I will work uh, as a, a chair of the committee with you and with him and with DEP to sort of meet our shared goal. I appreciate it. Well, th I really appreciate it. Thank you for coming uh, for, you know, and delivering this test. We need to have voices from communities to let us know how we're doing. Yeah. And we need to do this in partnership. So I definitely appreciate your time. Yes, thank you so much. And if, I don't know if you want to stay around for some other testimony. Well, or you, you have time. I, I would actually like to leave if you don't mind. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Ms. Lawton, thank you oh, so okay, much for your testimony. I really appreciate okay, you, you, you being here today. Thank you. Yeah. All right, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Stuart O'Brien. I'm executive director of the Plumbing Foundation. I will skip the first page of my prepared testimony and go straight to the second page. Uh, is I, I want to give some context to this. Um, on this I'm talking about uh, 821. Uh, backflow. Uh, the testimony earlier sort of made it sound like this was a, uh, nobody said it was a relatively new law, but it was giving, us a giving figures, uh, and, but you have to put this into context. This is a 1981 law that requires certain buildings to have backflow devices installed to protect the public. This is not recent. Um, so it's 36 years that since it went into effect. Uh, and what we need to know is how many buildings have to have these devices installed, how many are required to have them installed, how many buildings have them installed, and then you can figure out the compliance rate, and each year you track, is it going up from 70% to 72%, and you see if there's progress. In 2007, just 10 years ago, the New York Times reported that close to 100,000 large residential and commercial buildings in New York City lacked these devices, uh, and that 26,000 of these are especially at high risk because they include factories, gasoline stations, funeral homes, hospitals, or otherwise housed businesses that handle hazardous materials. An internal 2000 DEP report 17 years ago concluded that even in the high-risk pool, that 26,000 that I just mentioned, only 30% were in compliance. In 2007, the New York Times article entitled Many Buildings Lack Required Water Valve reported that as many as 85,000 large residential and commercial buildings lacked the device, with approximately 26,000 being classified as high risk. After the New York Times article, this committee, uh, and I testified at the time, held hearings in 2009. I'm giving the dates to indicate this has been an issue for oh, yeah, quite some I time. I was here in 2009 as a staff <laughs> member, I remember. I know. I know. Uh, on ways to better ensure compliance with this important self-law, which had then been in effect for 28 years. One proposed solution was to create a simple transporting, uh, transparent reporting system by which DEP informs the council on the city's effort to achieve compliance. What was requested was simple. DEP was to establish the number of buildings that required the device, the number that had the device installed, 
and the number of annual testing reports filed with DEP on those installed devices. DEP at that time objected to those criteria. Rather, what resulted was Local Law 26 of 2009, which required DEP to report, DEP to, report to, to the Council uh, the number of buildings with devices installed and thereafter twice each year the number of new devices installed since the previous report. First, this was a flawed reporting system since there was no requirement to establish an actual universe of buildings where installation was, where, was required. It is fairly useless to know, for example, that 100 buildings installed the device in the past six months. Is that 100 out of a universe of 1,000 buildings outstanding or 20,000? You can't determine a compliance rate unless the universe is established. Also, since virtually all brand new large uh, uh, newly constructed structures require the device before a certificate of occupancy can be issued, the report on new installations is inflated because it missed, mis mixed existing and new buildings. Is the 100 installations mostly in new buildings with little increase in compliance in existing buildings? Second, the semi-annual report to the City Council is still on the books. While DEP initially fulfilled its reporting obligations, we believe that it has failed to submit those reports to the City Council and comply with the law the last few years. We encourage the Council to discuss with the Administration why it appears that DEP hasn't been following the law the past few years. Maybe I'm mistaken, but I haven't seen any of those reports in the last few years. Um, uh, before the Committee today is Intro 821, which is designed to tighten up the reporting requirements of Local Law 76 of 2009. It requires DEP to report to the Council on definitive milestones so the Council and the public can determine whether compliance of this health law is being achieved. In particular, it requires DEP to establish a universe of buildings requiring compliance and a running total of those buildings that have actually, actually installed devices. We heard numbers before. What context is that? 2,000 you know, violations given. Out of how many, right? You asked a very simple question. If 2,000 were given notices, uh, what happened to those 2,000? Did they get them installed or not? We reported violations were given out, but was it on that? Or it's this very simple system that 20, 821 is asking for. What's the universe, which we understand is always going to go up. You know, you know, it's static, but it doesn't change by thousands. It changes by uh, small numbers. Is it 26,000 high hazard? And how many of those have the devices installed? If it's 24,000, I'd say we're doing a pretty good job. If it's 10,000, it doesn't have a, uh, we're not doing a good job. And all we're asking is after 36 years, DEP should be reporting on what the compliance rate is. And let me just finish. Uh, uh, one suggestion is we believe the intro should be amended, if possible, so that the universe is not an estimate. It should be an actual number. Other agencies have established actual databases of buildings requiring the inspection of boilers, elevators, facades, cooling towers. After decades, DEP should be required to establish how many buildings require this safety device. And lastly, the public and the City Council deserve to know compliance rates on this 36-year-old health and safety, uh, safety law. There is no valid reason not to. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Clark. My name is Arthur Clark. Thank you for having me here, Chairman Consonatus. Uh, I'm the training director for the Plumbers Local Union No. 1 Trade Education Fund. This jointly administered labor and management fund operates a 40,000 square foot training center located in Queens. In that facility, we operate the Cross Connection Control Bureau, a New York State Department of Health regulated training program to certify backflow prevention device testers. In fact, it's the most active certifying program of this type in New York State and open to any individual who needs this uh, New York State Department of Health certification. Students in the program study the causes and effects of backflow in the water supply system and learn the skills necessary to keep the equipment which prevents backflow in good working order. I'm here today because I want to raise awareness of the fact that the public health risks associated with backflow are increasing, not decreasing, due to new systems being installed throughout the city, 
while at the same time our Department of Environmental Protection is still not doing enough to prevent opportunities for contamination which already exist. A large concern of the DEP is sustainability and conservation of our water resources. Another major concern of the DEP is combined sewer overflows. We just had testimony about problems due to possibly combined sewers. Um, combined sewer overflows which threaten the health of our waterways. For these reasons and others, the DEP has encouraged and even funded through direct grants private projects for reuse of wastewater in buildings, as well as projects for capture and use of rainwater. Many residential and commercial buildings in New York City have recently installed such captured rainwater systems in accordance with green building initiatives and the DEP financing. However, these systems, while environmentally friendly, can be extremely dangerous if not handled carefully. The potential for hazardous cross connections can increase where reused water systems and drinking water systems are close together. The greatest threat posed by reuse of wastewater or captured rainwater is that potential for cross connection between the drinking water system and the reused water system. Of course, there are rules that prohibit cross connections. Our plumbing code prohibits cross connections in plumbing systems. However, a code book without enforcement to ensure compliance or data collection, as the previous speaker just talked about, uh, is a system that doesn't protect anyone. The best defense against illness or death from hazardous backflow is a good backflow prevention program. In fact, a rigorous program is uh, which is prosecuted diligently and effectively is the only defense there is, which is why it is mandated by the state and federal government. Our New York City Department of Environmental Protection has shown through its own calculations that installation, testing, and maintenance of these safety devices in New York City has been inadequate over many years. In light of these figures, a more aggressive and effective enforcement of the requirements would seem the best course of action. However, the DEP has no plans to prosecute its backflow prevention program in the diligent manner required. In fact, statistics show that they have allowed the current situation to deteriorate by their lax oversight and enforcement policies. Potable versus non-potable water. Plumbers, engineers, doctors, and the DEP call safe drinking water potable water. Frequently, we hear that reclaimed water is good for all sorts of non-potable uses. There are different treatment levels for reclaimed water depending on intended use. Reclaimed water systems in buildings uh, for non-drinking uses like irrigation, sidewalk washing, uh, makeup water for boilers, cooling towers, and most notably for flushing toilets and in private and public restrooms. However, make no mistake, even reclaimed water that receives disinfection can pose an acute health risk if it is mixed accidentally into drinking water. Disinfection against present bacteria and viruses does not even take into consideration the long list of chemical contaminants which are likely present in reclaimed water. These may include lead and other heavy metals, nitrogen, phosphorus, volcanic organic, uh, volatile organic compounds, and even prescription medication residue among a host of other pollutants. It is the express responsibility under the law for the purveyor of water, and that's the DEP, to operate an effective backflow prevention program Failure to do so opens the city to tremendous legal exposure if a catastrophic backflow event should occur. Cross connections can occur no matter how diligently we try to prevent them, and backflow preventers remain the best defense against backflow. The American Water Works Association is the best source of guidance for matching the backflow preventer to the application or the hazard condition at the site. The AWWA identifies reclaimed water as a hazardous, uh, excuse me, a health hazard and recommends the use of a reduced pressure zone backflow preventer for the buildings served by reclaimed water systems. Approved backflow prevention assemblies should be tested at least annually as outlined by American Water Works Association and all the manufacturers. The annual failure rates of approved assemblies varies from 10 percent to 40 percent and the AWWA and the manufacturers of these, devi these devices recommend testing at least every year to be sure of proper function. Based on the failure rates of approved assemblies, it should be assumed that valves in most backflow prevention assemblies will fail sometime within five years. Under these circumstances, just installing these devices and then failing to enforce the requirements for testing or replacing them gives the public a false sense of security. It also leaves the purveyor of water, which is ultimately the city of New York, open to tremendous legal exposure if a catastrophic, if a catastrophic backflow event should occur. In summation, we already had a host of possible cross-connection hazards to worry about before we added reclaiming water and capturing rainwater. These risks increase significantly if we fail to recognize and acknowledge them. The potential for cross-connections and backflow will increase as reclaimed water lines are installed in buildings. The best defense against backflow is a well-developed backflow prevention program. Preventing cross-connections via plan and site review of new construction 
and surveying and retrofitting of existing facilities should be a major focus of that program. The DEP has not kept true to this mission. The ongoing failure is particularly true for the maintenance and repair piece of the program. Reclaiming wastewater and capturing rainwater are great ideas on many levels, but it's important to bear in mind that this is not drinking water and if ingested represents a recognized health hazard. We already had an existing universe of possible sources of contamination in any building and we are currently adding more. Intro 821, if enacted into law, will help keep New York a healthy city. Thank you. Thank you both. So I have a couple of quick questions. Um, I definitely appreciate your uh, years of uh, experience here. I mean, we've, I think we've been working together on this issue uh, together before I was a council member when I was working for the former chair, Councilman Gennaro. Uh, so it's good to see you both. Um, but so intro 821, outside of that small change, you guys support the bill, right? Support the recording requirements within it? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And, you know, what other actions does the city take to prevent contamination of the water supply via backflow? I think, I think some of the most important uh, actions that, that, that have to be taken are, are exactly what we're discussing here. These devices are critical to prevent backflow. Any building uh, that's been identified as needing a backflow preventer is potentially a source of contamination. The water could leave the building carrying with it contaminants which go into the public system, then go down the street, somebody drinks it. This can happen anytime there's a fire. When a fire engine hooks up to a, a hydrant, we were talking earlier about that with a, a different bill, that causes a pressure drop in the system. And if you have multiple fire engines, you get a big pressure drop. The pressure inside the buildings is now higher, the water starts to flow out, taking anything that might be in there out with it. Um, this is anytime you have dry cleaning establishment, anytime you have any kind of chemicals in the boiler, things like that. These devices, if they're installed, they do their job, but they fail within five years, they're gonna fail. They need to be maintained. The state runs a rigorous training program for people to maintain these. It's a simple procedure, it's not expensive. You do some testing, you find out if it works. If it works, we're good. If it doesn't work, you get it fixed. Nobody's monitoring this, nobody's enforcing this. It's just not being done. Let That's the most important thing in my mind. Let me add, you, Council Member, you're absolutely right. You've been, you asked all the right questions, probably because you've been on this for so long. Uh, uh, you asked the right questions of DEP when they testified, which is forgetting about the issue I talked about, getting compliance rates after 36 years. But when you identify, and when they identify, there were 2,000 buildings that were instructed to get um, uh, these devices installed. What happened? It seems to me if I was in charge of that program and testifying on a bill, I'd know the answer of, well, there were 2,000 notices we gave out to people. Of those 2,000, 1,000 of them put them in by the end of the year within a certain period of time. Of the other 1,000, we gave them a violation, and that led to another 500 being put in. And then those guys, we upped the violation, so that now the penalty instead of being $1,000 was $2,500. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a program, right? And if I'm testifying before the city council on an issue, that's what I would like to hear, the answers to your questions. I was a little surprised that they, they, you didn't get them today um, because... I'm looking forward to getting them. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, it, 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 it should be interesting. The other thing, and you raised an excellent point, which is if the, if the fine is only a $500 or $1,000, what incentive is that for uh, a large landlord to, to do this? You know, there are landlords and there are landlords. Uh, there are a lot of landlords who will comply with the law that it comes in, but there are some who are really recalcitrant. Uh, and unfortunately, the penalties have to be sufficient to get them uh, to get their attention. So you asked all the right questions, and it should be interesting for you to find out uh, the responses. I'm looking forward to getting the answers because I am concerned about the issue of, of you know, the bad actors, right? I think we have a lot of good actors um, in the city of New York. I don't want to paint such a broad brush, right, and say that we have a lot of, you know, everyone's a bad actor. But there are some that are looking at the fine and, and looking at the installation of the device and doing a comparison shopping and saying, um, you know, can I get away with it and how long can I push this off for? Um, so I want to make sure um, that we are uh, making sure that there isn't a choice, that they have to comply, they have to comply immediately, 
and that we can kind of move the move the needle quickly. So with that, uh, unless you have anything else to say, I will thank you both for your advocacy and, and appreciate uh, your continued efforts and look forward to working with you again. Oh, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank, thank you. you. All right, so uh, Daniel Carpen, if, uh, so I have you testifying three different times, four different times here. No, no, nothing. Uh, can you please raise your right hand? You swear for him to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today. Yes, I do. My name is Daniel Carpin. I'm a registered professional engineer. My address is 3 Harbor Hill Drive, Huntington, New York, 11743. I want to comment about the repair of fire hydrants. About 15 months ago, I watched a DEP crew repair a broken hydrant. There were two men, they came up with a truck well equipped with lots of equipment and repair parts. And they were very, very efficient at, putting, at fixing and repairing hydrants. The question is, why are hydrants inoperable? It's because they leak. And when they leak, someone goes into the street and there's a valve and shuts the hydrant off. There is no reason for a three or four day delay in getting a hydrant fixed the fire department re re responds to fires in five minutes. There's no reason why the DEP can't respond to broken or inoperable hydrants within 24 hours. If the reason is inadequate resources, they should hire additional people and find out where they need one additional crew, two additional crews, where to put them, buying a truck, and doing that. They didn't, the person who spoke, if I was the commissioner and I heard what he had to say, I would be embarrassed. If I was the commissioner of DEP and I just took over the job of being commissioner, I heard about this problem, the first thing I'd want to know is how much more resources do we have need to commit to take care of this problem much more quickly? If they needed additional truck and additional two, two mechanics, go out and hire them. But there's a problem hiring them. There's a nine-month wait between the some, someone is actually interviewed for a job with the city and the time you actually start working. It's five to 11 months, and Samara, you can, you can testify to that. So the human resources groups in the city have to figure out how to hire people quicker to solve all these DEP problems. It's not just money. It's just getting the stuff done. If they need to buy a new truck, that means the city has to put out the bid, buy all the equipment, all the parts, the tools that the, f the fellas need to repair the hydrant. You know, it's, it's basically, it's no excuse for a three-day delay in repairing a hydrant. There's no reason why they can't, they can't come the same day. They get a call in the morning. They should be there in the afternoon. If there's insufficient manpower, the fellas should have told the committee, we don't have enough people. We need some resources to do it. Fortunately, the city's in a good financial condition, so it can afford it. Is that the entirety of your testimony? Sir? That's on the um, that's on the fire hydrants. Okay, we can move on to the next one. I'm going to give you two minutes on the next one. So okay, as far as uh, sewer backup concerned, mm -hmm. Southeast Queens suffers sewer backups much more in our parts of the city because at one time there were lots of freshwater wetlands there with frogs, and unfortunately the frogs got towed away when the city developed that area. That area should have never been built on. It's too flat. When you have flat areas and the pipes are flat, horizontal, the flow rates are not big enough. You may need to, you may need to dig up the streets and spend hundreds of millions of dollars and repipe everything in order to correct the problem of flooding. 
And if, if there's a problem with people eating too much greasy food, then I think the school system in the city has done the right thing by going to salad bars. And when I was in high school, we used to have hamburgers that were baked, not fried, and we called them grease burgers for that reason. A, a good education program to eat, get people to eat fresh fruits and vegetables, and I go through five to ten pounds of fresh fruits and vegetables a day. No grease goes down, down my drain whatsoever. I think we have some real problems. She expressed real concerns. The DEP just hasn't put the resources into it to fix the, the drain system, the, the sewer system in southeast grids. It's going to cost a lot of money because it's flat. And as far as the catch basin concern, they should be cleaned in the fall when they get clean, clogged with leaves from the trees, not, not every 12 months. The fall is when you have to clean the catch basins before the winter snow, snows then clog them up and sand comes in the streets. It's continuous. It's not just every 12 months. You've got you to continually inspect them every three months if you want to get catch basins that are, are going to stay clean and useful and functional. Okay. All right, sir, thank you so much for your testimony. I appreciate it. Thank you for being here today and, and for your advocacy on the myriad of issues this committee faces. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, with that, um, I want to uh, thank the, the administration for their testimony today, for our advocates that came out and spoke on these issues. Uh, we look forward to uh, moving these pieces of legislation to get good results for the people of the city of New York. Uh, I want to thank our uh, staff attorney uh, for the Environmental Protection Committee, Samara Swanston, our uh, policy analyst, Nadia Johnson, our uh, finance analyst, John Seltzer, as well, uh, thank our committee clerk, Phil Martin, for being here for our votes. Thank you, sir. And, uh, of course, my staff, uh, Nick Wazowski, my legislative counsel, uh, and our sergeants in arms as well. So with that, uh, we will gavel this committee hearing on the, the Committee on Environmental Protection closed.